We're here today visiting with Bob Tedford, an ex-member of Maranatha Christian Ministries. This is a group we believe is a destructive cult. Bob, could you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with Maranatha Ministries and how long you were involved and what were the circumstances about your joining? Okay. Uh, I joined Maranatha Campus Ministries in uh, August of 1981. I first uh, came back to for the fall semester at K-State and uh, I've been out since February the 21st of 1983 and uh, the, the way that I got in was uh, pretty much through uh, an outreach that they had. They had what they called a Change Your Life Seminar and uh, when I came back in the fall I was really disillusioned with my Christian faith and I was ready for some changes. I'd had a very difficult summer. I quit uh, work during uh, July. I was convinced I could get another job and I couldn't find another job so I ended up being unemployed for over a month. I had a roommate that uh, didn't return in the fall. He ended up getting married and uh, moving off and I was disappointed about that, having to get another roommate and the guy we got as a substitute roommate uh, really didn't fit up, you know, wasn't too cooperative and had hard times, you know, making his payments and stuff and I was really upset. It was a sort of a low point in my life but yet uh, I was very idealistic and very hopeful about a lot of the stuff uh, about the semester. And my first contact really with Maranatha was uh, in walking across campus, I heard Bryce Brooks preaching outside. And the first day I heard him preaching, I was sort of embarrassed. I thought, well, you know, this is a really radical guy to stand out in front of the Union preaching about Jesus Christ. And so the first day I sort of, you know, just wanted to put my hand over my face and just walk on by. But the next day I... I stood by there and I listened to the guy and he sounded really good and the message was a message on a hundred percent commitment to Jesus Christ and some people approached me and invited me to a meeting that night which was just a cross in the switchblade movie and um, my girlfriend uh, had joined a Bible study over the summer and her Bible study was going to the same cross in the switchblade uh, movie so I decided I'd just go there and she told me that she'd just meet me at the Bible study uh, little did I know that the Bible study that she was in was this uh, Maranatha group and also I didn't know that the uh, Change Your Life Seminar was uh, to draw people in for Maranatha. I thought that the Change Your Life Seminar was just uh, Rice Brooks, uh, a preacher coming through campus and he'd just be there for maybe um, a week or something. I think on the thing it said it'd be that he'd be there uh, maybe Monday through Friday. And so I started going to these meetings every night and uh, people started inviting me out for Cokes and the next thing I knew uh, I had, within two weeks, I'd committed my life to Maranatha Campus Ministries. Well, how long were you in the group, Bob? Uh, well, uh, I was in the group for uh, full time into the group, about two and a half semesters. And uh, towards the end of the period, I started going through a lot of confusion and stuff. And I uh, was actually told that uh, the Lord was telling them that I should go somewhere else. and. Uh, I didn't feel like the Lord was telling me to go anywhere else, and I ended up being shunned, and uh, church uh, discipline was administered to me. Uh, this is also called uh, excommunication in some other churches. Uh, it caused such confusion in my life that eventually I had to come and get some counseling to get stuff scored away in my own self. And uh, for myself, I've been out of Maranatha Campus Ministries since uh, the 21st of February, 1983. Uh, three and a half semesters after I actually uh, joined the group. Bob, maybe we might go back and review some of the uh, experiences that you had in uh, Maranatha Ministries. At the beginning of the tape, we mentioned that we felt this was a destructive cult. And I think in uh, our terminology, the, the definition that we use to gauge a group uh, comes from Robert J. Lifton, the fellow who studied the Korean War vets that came out. Approximately 550 of those people were tried for treason at the end of the war and were acquitted on the grounds that they had been brainwashed. And Robert Lifton, in his book, Thought Reform and Psychology of Totalism, chapter 22, identifies eight steps. And I feel, as many people do, that if a group practices these eight steps, then there is very much cause for alarm. So with that, maybe we ought to review these eight steps and see if, in fact, uh, what uh, degree Maranatha practices these. Uh, the first of these uh, uh, eight steps is meal you control or uh, environmental control. Could you uh, start elaborating on 
what they do to accomplish that? But as far as the environmental control goes, I think people, when they first hear that phrase, they think, well, do they tie the people up or and force them to stay in, in their group and stuff like this? Uh, it's really not that kind of control that you maybe think of, uh, that the, they actually force you to stay there, but it's more of an isolation type thing. Uh, I, as a member, I feel, I feel that this is prevalent in all the groups, is that the people are isolated from the outside world socially and also physically. Uh, they're encouraged to live with one another. Uh, I was told to move in with some brothers, and uh, I refused to you know, go, do such, move in with them, because I'd be paying double the rent I had been paying, and I would have been six blocks away from campus instead of just across the street from campus. But uh, physically, I was isolated. Every day I would be over to, at the Maranatha Center, and every day virtually they would either call me or somebody would stop by my place. So physically I was isolated, but even more importantly than physically was I isolated. Uh, socially I was isolated from the group. Um, I was told uh, through the teachings and stuff, you know, the Bible told me to burn bridges, to come out from their midst and be separate. There's a scripture that says, therefore come out from their midst and be separate. And uh, I took that scripture and I didn't want to compromise my faith, so I broke ties with all my old friends who wanted to just run around and not take life serious. And I started running around with only Maranatha people, people who were 100% committed to Jesus Christ. Uh, okay, other points of isolation uh, that I see is that they really get into talking about humanism and, and liberal theology. So right from the start, you start learning to not trust your ministers, your background, that uh, these seminaries, the ministers and all, uh, the other teaching books that other churches and church groups use is filled with humanism and, and liberal theology. So you need to depend on the groups and their teachings because they take everything directly from the Bible. And also with newspapers and textbooks, classroom textbooks, that uh, these, uh, you know, it's required to study them to get our degrees and stuff, but not to take everything that they say, especially psychology and a lot of these things, that they're from a humanistic point of view and, and not, they're not from a biblical point of view. Uh, so you have isolation from the outside world. Also with your parents, uh, my parents uh, could tell that something was up when I joined the group, and they mailed me an article on uh, Maranatha. They didn't know at that time that I joined Maranatha, but uh, they just you know, wanted me to be aware that there was groups up there. And from the minute that they sent me that thing, I never trusted my parents again. I felt like they were listening to uh, evil forces that they wouldn't give me a chance in my faith. And my roommates uh, started questioning me. Uh, one of my roommates, uh, Chuck, uh, told me that I was just becoming crazy. And he ended up moving out because I became so religious that I thought that that was just because uh, my lifestyle was such a witness to him that it was putting him under conviction and that uh, you know, that was the reason that he'd moved out. What about the time requirements? Uh, well, where it maybe isn't a physical okay. uh, isolation, but okay. maybe more of a mental. Yeah, also the time requirements. The meetings are required to go to attend for the most part. Every once in a while they make, make an exception. But there are many meetings, uh, secret meetings and all. Plus there's a teaching that comes out, uh, it's brought out that, uh, you know, we sleep eight hours a day, and, you know, that's one third of your life that you're spent in bed, you know, sleeping. And there's scriptures that say, you know, don't be a sluggard, and the warnings of this. And if you can just cut back 30 more minutes, you know, just get up 30 more minutes early and have a quiet time with the Lord, that that'd be 30 more minutes a day that you could have for God. And if you didn't watch the TV, in the evenings, it would be that much more time. So you learn to not watch TV. You learn not to waste your time reading um, humanism, you know, in magazines and newspapers. Uh, you quit running around with old friends. You start running around with Bible thumpers, you know, uh, people who can quote the word, and you start uh, spending time listening to these teaching tapes and getting your life 100% uh, committed to Jesus Christ and being raised to maturity. Um, I'm for myself, you know, I, uh, many of us in our fellowship. Uh, started becoming very disciplined and, with our teachings and with our schedules, and I'm in engineering, and that major in itself take, demands a lot of time. And so myself and another brother or two started up what we called the Edison Study Method, and we read that uh, some of the great men and inventors, uh, like Edison, had gotten down to like only two hours of sleep a day, and he'd just take short naps throughout the day, and John Wesley 